Here's what's coming today on the Woodworking Network podcast. And uh, he said, well, Doug, I don't know why you would be um, studying to be a lawyer when your brains are in your hands. Welcome to this episode of the Woodworking Network podcast. Join us as we explore the business of woodworking, big and small, and what it takes to succeed. I'm Will Sampson. Today's episode is sponsored by WoodPro Expo California. We'll be talking with woodworker and educator Doug Stowe about his thoughtful new book, The Wisdom of Our Hands. But first, I want to talk about Maker or Thinker. There's been a lot of attention paid to what's been called the maker movement. It's a trend for people making things themselves rather than just buying something off the shelf. But it also is related to do-it-yourself home improvements and even hackers who take already existing things, reimagine them, and re-engineer them to create something else. I've been a maker since my first primitive efforts as a child, My father was not naturally handy, but I loved working with him on small craft projects like assembling an electric train set, painting bookshelves, or doing some scouting craft. He was not a woodworker, and there was no shop or extensive collection of tools in the house. His primary tools were in his head and mostly came out as facts and figures on paper. He was a business executive for several major corporations before cancer took him when I was just nine years old. Consequently, I've grown up with both those maker and business thinker traits combined. I started two businesses that paid my way through college, and one was a small manufacturing operation. But my college degree in journalism had more to do with thinking and analyzing than making. Still, my business, woodworking, and metalworking activities have always given me a focus on people who make a life making things. I also love teaching people to make things and watch the glow of accomplishment in their faces when they succeed. I think we've let too many people bypass that joy of making things. We've dismissed the thinking component of making to our own detriment. If you make, you have to think. But some thinkers never make anything physical. Maybe we'd all be better off if the thinkers learned to make something too. Before we get to our interview with Doug Stowe, let's pause for a word from our sponsor. It's really easy for woodworkers to stay stuck inside, focused on their shops and production. But over the last couple of years, the pandemic has forced them to be even more isolated than usual. Now it's time to get out of the shop and resume life in the outside world, especially when it's a chance to network with your woodworking business peers. That opportunity is coming April 27th, 29th in sunny San Diego as the Wood Pro Expo joins with the Closets Conference and Expo to offer an unparalleled opportunity to boost your business with intelligence on techniques, tools, and technology. Let's get face-to-face again. Learn more at woodproexpocalifornia.com. See you there. Now let's talk about the wisdom of our hands with Doug Stowe. Today our guest is Doug Stowe, author of a new book titled The Wisdom of Our Hands. Doug is a longtime woodworker, well known for his intricately inlaid boxes, and he's also an educator. Welcome to the Woodworking Network podcast, Doug. Well, thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Well, I'm sure it's going to be interesting. I I thoroughly enjoyed your book. Um, some of the connections you make in the book between manual training and how we learn. But tell us first, how did the book come about? Well, many, many years ago, uh, I had um, I was at the edge of dropping out of college. I'd gone home to tell my parents that I didn't have a, any intention of returning for the final semester. I was in my senior year. And my parents had this idea that I was I was to become a lawyer because my grandfather was and my great grandfather they were both lawyers so uh, something about family tradition and all that stuff and and I was just disgusted with myself and with college and the abstractness of it and I 
And so on the way to my parents' house, I stopped to see a friend of mine who had helped me restore an antique Ford. And uh, he said, well, Doug, I don't know why you would be um, studying to be a lawyer when your brains are in your hands. And, and so that came as a complete shock to me that um, I, th I thought the brains were one thing and the hands were something else. And so um, I went back to school and I um, managed to squeak by, uh, courtesy of a, um, I think, professors who took, uh, took pity on me. And I took a class in pottery and uh, a class in creative writing, and I just decided I was going to make make some fun of it, and um, which I did, and I ended up graduating. And but then uh, when I was out of school, wondering, well, what am I going to do with myself? Um, I thought woodworking. You know, my father had bought a shopsmith for me when I was fourteen years old, so. Um, that was it, it and I were the same age 1948 models and um and so I uh I, I thought that would be a pretty cool thing and so um yeah, you know shaggy dog stories they take a little while to get to the point um later on um I started really thinking about uh, I was inspired by James Cranall, as many people were, you know, I mean, he he talked about woodworking in a way that helped you to know there's more about it, it was less about sticking part A on part B than it was about shaping your own mind and the way you thought about things. And um, so I made a lot, a lot, a lot of boxes, you know, I made um, little boxes because I was living in a a small town where I live now, Eureka Springs, Arkansas, it's a tourist town. And so what are tourists going to carry home? Um, little knickknacks and boxes. And so I made a lot of boxes and, and um, along the way, um, it caught the attention, my inlaid boxes caught the attention of a publisher. It was a guy by the name of David Lewis from uh, F&W Publications. And that's an umbrella company that at that time owned popular woodworking magazine and um, the Woodworkers Book Club. And they'd had a focus group and the focus group said, well, you know, inlay might be a real hot subject and boxes might be a real hot subject. And so he saw my inlay boxes and said, I'm going to ask this guy to write a book. <laughs> Get all of it in one book. <laughs> yeah. And so um, I, I told David, I said, you know, I'm not really interested in writing a a how-to book. I'd rather write a why-to book. I'm really inspired by the writings of James Cranov, and I'd like to pick up the dialogue where he left off. And David said, well, you know, if you can give me 16 projects, I'll give you a sidebar in each chapter <laughs> where you can talk about philosophy to your heart's content. And so uh, it, it turned out to be a good formula. And, and then I but I, it still, you know, was all these years since that guy told me my brains were in my hands. I was still thinking about it, you know, and I was thinking that um, it was obviously true for me. And I was observing how my hands brought about some clarity to what I was thinking. And, um, and so I, um, after being a little bit successful in, publishing, I thought, well, I'll, I'll get into teaching. And so I did at Clear Spring School. I taught a little bit of adult uh, education stuff. I taught uh, for some woodworking clubs, and I taught at Aramont and, and, uh, uh, and other craft schools. And, um, and so I, I started the Wisdom of the Hands woodworking program at Clear Spring School to try to um, develop this idea that I was thinking about, how the brains and the hands are integrally a part of each other. And I had also um, had this idea that I wasn't alone in having uh, my brains and my hands connected. I decided that it was probably something that was true for everyone. Well, that's that's real interesting. Um, you know, you you talk in the book. Uh, you frequently mentioned the educational sloid. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yes, you are. Um, 
can you explain what what that is and the history behind it? Because it kind of runs parallel to some of the things that you're talking about. Well, educational Sloyd was a system of woodworking education that started in Finland and Sweden. And it really originated with a guy by the name of Uno Signeus. And Uno Signeus had been uh, challenged by the Russian czar who was in control of, of Finland at that time. To, um, to develop a system of folk schools. And so Signeus had looked all over Europe trying to figure out what would, what would be the best model to use. And at that time, uh, Friedrich Froebel's kindergarten had, um, had been developed but um, outlawed by the, uh, by the German government. And, um, and Signeus decided that that was the ideal um, method to introduce to the folk schools because it involved play and it involved uh, sequential growth and a, and a holistic uh, viewpoint. And so he, the kindergarten at that time only went up until you're eight years old. And so he decided he had to have something that would go beyond that. And he decided that crafts were the ideal way to extend the kindergarten style of learning into the upper grades. And at the same time, um, shortly thereafter, uh, Otto Salomon in Sweden uh, was captured by the same idea for many of the same reasons. And so kindergarten and educational Sloyd grew up almost together as a, as a movement. And, uh, and so um, it was a, a system, uh, you know, I first learned about educational Floyd when I was visiting at North Bennett Street School, which was one of the places in the United States where educational Floyd was first introduced. North and, Bennett um, Street is actually the very first trade school in the United States. And it, so it was actually North Bennett Street School has a very complex but very interesting relationship with manual arts training in the United States. But when I was at North Venice Street School, um, I was explaining my program that I was establishing at Clear Spring School. And they said, oh, you mean Sloyd? And I'd never heard Sloyd except for Sloyd knives were sold in the Woodcraft catalog right. at that time. You know? <laughs> and you didn't know why it was called a Sloyd knife. But um, but it, it, it's a, it was a, a program of woodworking education that recognized that woodworking education was about a lot more than just filling jobs in industry. It, it recognized that uh, when you make something, you're not just making something, you are in fact making yourself. You are developing your skills, which gives you higher value, not only as economic value, but higher value within society. Um, a higher point of um, reference for who you are. Uh, and, and, you know, I, take, I make something in the shop and um, I'll take it in on the, put it on the kitchen counter so my wife can see if it's small enough. Because I want, I want, others to recognize something that I have accomplished. I'm, you know, um, one of the things I mentioned in the book is uh, islands of competence. And as you develop, you are then inclined to go to the next level. And then from there to the next level and from there to the next level. And But it's intrinsic. It's not something that someone has told you you have to do. It's something that uh, excites you on the inside. And that's, that, you know, is really what I think the model of education should be. Um, and very much based on what Friedrich Froebel was developing in kindergarten, and then what Uno Signeus was developing in educational Sloyd. Well, if you aren't excited about what you're learning, you're not going to continue in any other learning adventures, and you're not going to expand what you're learning. It, um, you know, my mother was a kindergarten teacher, so she would, um, when, when parents would come for conferences, uh, she would say, when your child comes home from school and you've asked your child, what did they do today? And they say, play, you should know that they're giving you the right answer. <laughs>
because learning is actually fun. Well, if we make it fun, it can be. <laughs> it can be fun. You know, yeah. um, you you ran the, uh, the the piece about Gary Knox Bennett, and I, I think he's a good example of someone who took his uh, his education as limited as it was, and built something from it because he was having a damn good time. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Lots of, lots of fun and a great sense of humor. Great sense of humor. Yeah. Well, I, I thought the discussion in your book about Scandinavian manual training uh, and manual education was fascinating. Um, I, th I think a lot of people think that Europe is way ahead of us in manual training, but they're thinking about apprenticeships and training for the trades. And, and, and that hasn't always been the case. Um, I have a good friend in, in Sweden who actually founded a uh, private trade school decades ago there because there wasn't enough public education for the trades there. So it's, mm -hmm. you know, all education is always in flux, no matter what. Yeah. But, you know, the, the thing that that I, I really liked about your book, um, too, is is kind of the things that you've touched on of the, the benefits that you see of early manual education or even adult manual education that go beyond training for the trades. Yeah. The. Um... There's a there's a wonderful essay by a guy by the name of. Um... David Henry Feldman, and he talks about the child as craftsman. And in his um, in his essay, The Child as Craftsman, he points out that, and David Henry Feldman was someone who really worked with the gifted and talented children and uh, a study of the one things that made them gifted and made them talented. And, uh, and, and yet it doesn't, it doesn't, only apply to them, but that every child has an inclination to try to, to want to get better at something, to get to a point where others recognize that the child has unique values, unique abilities. And so they, they instead of everybody wanting to do the same thing, they want to do different things. And even within a, when a, within a family, you know, I know my my sister was really involved in becoming an artist. And so I, I, for a long time, chose a different path. You know, I was to become the academic, which was why my parents thought I should become a lawyer. But, but we, we need to have education in, in which, instead of everybody becoming alike, coming out of an assembly line, we're all encouraged to become different and to find our own spark uh, that will carry us into whatever life presents. One of the quotes from the book that stands out a lot um, is, uh, uh, even poorly executed handwork teaches lessons to the learner, not the least of which is to value well-executed work. Um, I've always thought that people trying to do woodwork are much more appreciative of fine woodworking, no matter how successful their own woodworking efforts are. And I think part of the problem that we've had in the business side of woodworking in convincing people to value uh, high quality woodworking is that the average person that is a consumer of woodworking has no perception of what's involved in the process. I, I I think that's exactly right. They don't have a, they don't. And, you know, one of the, one of the things I mentioned in the book is um, that many of the people who have been encouraging of me and my work, I can trace back to them having had some experience related to what I do. <coughs> or for example, one friend of mine is a wood sculptor and she, commissioned me over a period of years to build a number of pieces for their home. Um, a very close friend of mine who had me build a number of pieces for their home um, has an art degree from Syracuse, and master's in fine arts, and along, along the way has become a wood sculptor. And so people who have a, um, a sense of what it takes to create something 
also have a sense of why they should support the creativity of others. Well, I think there's something too that you get out of learning that you can make things that you don't have to buy things, everything, um, you know, or, or get someone else to buy it for you. I have no idea if it ever, if it was connected to the educational Sloyd movement or anything, but, but I, I had the, the privilege of uh, being when I was in first grade in an elementary school in, in Southern California um, the there was a, a thing that was going on there where they equipped the first grade classrooms with woodworking hand tools and had integrated oh. that into the curriculum. So like we were, you know, studying transportation and we would take two boards and nail them crosswise and that's an airplane, you know, and whatever. It was all very simple, very primitive. Yeah. But you learned about measuring things. You learned about putting things together and uh uh, you sometimes tried things that were too difficult or whatever, but it was it was sort of bringing the the classroom talk about airplanes and trucks and trains and boats mm -hmm. and putting it through your hands. Yeah, I you know I've had students that um, would go with their parents to Walmart and walk through the toy section, and my student would tell his mother. You know, I could make that. Where did you go to school and um, what what city were you in in California? I was I was in Sherman Oaks, California, but uh, that particular school was uh, Roscomer Road Elementary School. Oh. And, I, and I talked years later to a uh, uh, a uh, vocational ed teacher in the LA school system. And, and I just asked him, you know, did you ever hear that? Was that something that was just in that school or whatever? He said it was pretty much district wide for a number of years. Um, but, uh, you know, it probably got cut in some budget cut or, or, yeah. you know, somebody hurt themselves and they decided the insurance load was too much or, or what, you know, it was just, there was no special teacher. It was the classroom teacher who was leading yeah. things. And, uh, um, it was, well, that you know, sounds but, very much like, uh, educational Sloyd because, um, Otto Salomon believed that, um, teachers made the best teachers of woodworking rather than craftsmen making the best teachers because a teacher would have a sense of the developmental needs of the child. And uh, there was a big movement of educational Floyd in California. Um, uh, Edna Ann Rich was, in, was one of the leaders and she wrote a book called Paper Sloyd, which many of your readers might be interested, might be interested in. Uh, because it was a precursor to working with wood, it would have been for kindergarten age kids and maybe for first grade, uh, where you take uh, paper and fold it. So it wasn't origami where you're making decorative things, you were making practical things like boxes and pinwheels and, and things like that. Um, scissor holders. Yep, yep. Beautiful little things made of paper chains. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I remember doing some of that, too. <laughs> Isn't it funny how, how the things that you actually did are so much more memorable than the things that you may have read? Well, I think there's, a, there's something, too, about the, the sense of accomplishment. Um, for a couple of summers, I taught a kids woodworking class that was like a, a week long program that that I developed there. I had the kids for like four hours a day for five days. And, uh -huh. uh, and it was a combined class that had kids from, uh, uh, I think it was first through fourth grades, uh -huh. and uh, uh, both boys and girls. And, you know, almost none of the kids had any experience working with tools or anything and mm -hmm. and i know that some parents and and some of the school people were terrified that some kid was going to hurt himself um but we didn't have any injuries and uh uh the kids went home with a, a finished project every day uh yeah and uh they were really excited and on the last day of the class uh, the project was to make a little tool tote and oh. uh I sent them home with that and a list 
of all the tools that they had used in the class and urged the parents to fill the tool tone. <laughs> And that's similar to a, a project we did during the pandemic. I want, I was concerned that the kids didn't have tools at home. And so um, over Zoom, we made toolboxes. And, uh, and when they would come on campus, I would supply some of the tools that they needed to go in there, like um, small hammers and, right. um, you know, at, at, it's interesting. The kids absolutely love it. They, you know, the mo moment they walk in. So I have my woodworking program at Clear Spring School, and um, the kids know immediately when they walk into the shop that there's something different about this place. You know, uh, it may be the mess that I've left on the floor preparing materials for them, but it's also the smell of the place. You know, the the aroma of the sawdust and. Uh, and there's something about the engagement of all the senses, you know, each and every one of our senses um, helps us to understand what's really real. A lot better than just uh, buying it off the shelf. <laughs> A lot better than buying it off the shelf. And, um, and it's funny, um, you know, modern manufacturing makes everything just fitting image perfect. And um, if it's a cereal box that has a little crimple in the corner, you may take it, take the one from behind it because we're so obsessed with this thing of being perfect. But when it comes to kids' works or, or our work as, as grown-ups, you know, um, we take great pride in things even when they're not absolutely perfect. Absolutely. That's... <laughs> There's, there was supposedly a California Indian tribe, the Pomo Indians, who were well known for their baskets. And uh, uh, they uh, uh, supposedly uh, left purposely a flaw, at least one flaw in every basket, so the demons could escape the basket. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've heard similar things about the Amish leaving one stitch undone rather than compete with um uh, with, with the perfection, perfection yeah the, yeah and i think i've heard of a similar tradition in japan um it's but you can you can have incredible craftsmanship as, as you know from many of the people you've written about or or talked to or supported in their work uh, you can have incredible craftsmanship that may seem almost miraculous to some people who are just starting out, you know. Um, but uh, I remember um, as an early subscriber to Fine Woodworking, you know, I was always just absolutely in awe of the things that I would see in there and then wondered what in the world would I have to do to reach a level in which I could be in the magazine. And then finally I was in the magazine, but it wasn't. Um, it, 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 you don't have to be perfect at everything. All you have to do is have a few good ideas and, and work your butt off, right? You just have to get started. And you have to get started. I, I think that's what's great about your book is 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 that it, it talks about introducing manual training and using your hands to everybody, regardless of where you think they're eventually going to wind up. And that it becomes a, a, just a, a life component. Uh, yeah. I, I think that's just a, a wonderful thing. I, I think a, a lot of our educators uh, would do well to, to uh, re-examine that value. It, uh, it could be as important, to be able to make could become as important to us as the ability to read. That's, um, that's a great thought. <laughs> And and the benefits of that is that we we would become so much more appreciative of each other. You know, we would in, instead of um, uh, feeling superior to the plumber who fixes the problem that we caused by flushing too much, trying to flush too much down. He might come in or she might come in and we would feel a sense of reverence and awe for that person for their abilities rather than being disparaging of them. 
Oh, absolutely. I think there's been a lot of, particularly in the public schools, of of trying to discourage people from going into trades and and handwork and and things like that. Uh, yeah. And and people like Mike Rowe have tried to turn that around. And yeah. And, uh, I think that's that's an important part, and I think that's something that's that comes out of your book too. Is the but the thing that I don't want to give people the wrong impression: the book is not about training people for trades. It's about the no. value of just learning through your hands. You know, like you said at the beginning, that uh, uh, your brain was in your hands. Well, I think a lot of people might find that their brain is in their hands too, uh, if they just gave it a chance. Even people who have uh, academic aspirations, you know, um, benefit from doing things that are real. You know, you can go way off in the deep, you can go way off the deep end in whatever you want to think or propose, you know, you can make stuff up and people make stuff up all the time. And um, it, it's good to really test everything and in physical life now so for example uh, someone wants to be a historian it would kind of help them to understand the tools of architecture for example it would help to put things in context it would um, it would help them to dig ditches if they want to know what it was like at gettysburg it would help them to nap flint if they want to know something about the American Indian or, or other indigenous tribes, it, um, it makes things richer and deeper. And in that depth, you find more excitement, you know, to have done something that's real. Um, and so it's, it's, it's not just, so an example, um, I have a, 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 a friend whose son had gone off to become a nuclear physicist working at um, the big collider uh, someplace. I think he was at Argonne Lab, National Lab. And they got to a point where their research project was shut down because they had to wait for the people to come, the technicians to come in to solve this particular physical problem. And so my friend's son went to the Ace Hardware store, <coughs> bought everything he needed, and had it working the next day. And there, there are all kinds of uh, examples like that of people who knew how to do things that then would transform everything. Uh, there was one guy who was working uh, on the uh, big oil spill down in the Gulf, you know, uh, that was such so catastrophic and they were trying to figure out how to cap the well and he's a, a guy from the think thinking place at mit and he left the meeting without talking to anybody went home and devised the thing and had it delivered while they were still talking about it you know that that's yeah. what the that's what the hands do absolutely yeah well the the uh, the book is called the wisdom of our hands uh, it's available uh, through Amazon and, and most uh, book outlets, and uh, it's by Doug Stowe. And thank you, Doug, for uh, spending some time with us today. This has You're been welcome. really great. And uh, now I want to get back and do something with my hands. That's it for today. If you're looking for more of our podcasts, you can find all of them at woodworkingnetwork.com slash podcasts and in popular podcast channels. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. Thanks again to today's sponsor, Wood Pro Expo. If you have a comment or topic you'd like us to explore, contact me at will.sampson at woodworkingnetwork.com. Thanks for listening.